So good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, free webinar. Thank you, Fatma, for the kind introduction. I'm uh, Dr. Mohammed Helmi. I'm the lead mentor and the head of the department of part one MRCG course at MedExam Expert. Uh, I'm so glad to have uh, all of you with me in this free webinar. Today, inshallah, I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, topic, which is phenyl pregnancy. I'm just uh, uh, I need all of you to close your mics to make sure that you, all your mics are closed. Okay. Uh, and if you have any question, please uh, raise your hand and then ask. And it's preferred, of course, to uh, uh, postpone the questions until the end of the of the webinar. So uh, today I'm talking about phenylketonuria in pregnancy, and this is one of the clinical topics which is related to the biochemistry subject in part one MRCG. So let's uh, uh, go to know about what's meant by phenylketonuria and what what uh, the what its impact on the pregnancy and how to manage the uh, cases having phenylketonuria while they are pregnant. So uh, before I proceed, because some of our colleagues are complaining of the voice, is the voice clear for everyone? Yes, sir, it's clear. Okay, so if you have any problem with the voice or the screen, please check your internet connection. So let's proceed and talk about the phenylketonuria. Of course, phenylketonuria is one of the inherited diseases. It's one of the inherited metabolic diseases. It's an autosomal recessive inheritance, autosomal recessive inheritance. And of course, if you are not sure about autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive, then you are going to wait for Dr. Desiree's webinar. This week also, she are going to talk about the pedigree analysis and tell you the modes of inheritance and what's meant by autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, X-linked disorders, and so on. So it's an autosomal recessive inherited metabolic disease caused by a deficiency in the liver enzyme called phenylalanine hydroxylase enzyme, phenylalanine hydroxylase enzyme deficiency. What is the importance of this enzyme? This enzyme is important to convert the phenylalanine into tyrosine, into tyrosine. So if we have a deficiency in this enzyme, this means that we, we are going to have a high levels or toxic levels of the phenylalanine in the blood and also there will be tyrosine deficiency. There will be tyrosine deficiency. So uh, the buildup of the toxic levels of phenylalanine in the blood, this can affect the brain, the affect the growth of the brain and also the myelin sheath synthesis. This is very important point because most of the problems caused by the high phenylalanine levels are related to the intellectual behavioral you know uh, uh, development uh, also the the uh, uh, psychological effect of this uh, uh, disease is well known because of its problem or its uh, uh, deleterious effect on the brain so most of the complications of the untreated phenylketonuria is due to the toxic levels of phenylalanine on the brain if you can see the diagram here, which is, of course, from the uh, 2018 talk, of course, published by the Royal College. And as you can see that most of the animal proteins contain this amino acid phenylalanine, which is converted by the phenylalanine hydroxylase into tyrosine. And from the tyrosine, dopamine, melanin, and other polyproteins are formed. So the tyrosine deficiency will also affect or make other problems. The incidence of this disease is about one in 10,000, most probably found in Caucasians and East Asians, and it's very rare in the Africans. So this is the incidence of that disease. How we classify the phenyl ketonuria? This disease can be classified according to the serum level of phenylalanine and the enzymatic deficiency, the degree of the enzymatic deficiency. 
Generally speaking, the normal levels of phenylalanine should be below 120 micromoles per liter. This is the normal phenylalanine levels. In the UK, we have two categories according to the divisions or according to the level of uh, uh, phenylalanine, we have the classical phenylketonuria and we have the non-classical phenylketonuria. The classical one means that the phenylalanine levels are typically above 1,200 micromoles, or we can say that we have a complete or profound deficiency of the enzyme. This is the classical one. The non-classical is subdivided into subgroups according to the level of phenylalanine, into mild moderate, and a category called hyperphenylalaninemia, okay? This mild one is where, where the phenylalanine is between 600 to 900 micromoles per liter. The moderate one, where the levels are between 900 and 1,200. And when we have levels less than 600 micromoles, but of course, more than 120, which is the normal level, we call that hyperphenylalanine. Okay, so these are the subcategories of the non classical phenylketonuria. So, what is the problem of the buildup of the phenylalanine, especially if a woman who is having the disease got pregnant? The elevated phenylalanine levels are teratogenic to the unborn fetus. So if a woman with the disease got pregnant, the phenylalanine is actively transported across the placenta to reach fetal concentrations, which are 1.25 to 2.5 times greater than the maternal concentrations. And this will, of course, affect the development of the fetus. This will cause a lot of problems, including intrauterine growth restriction, microcephaly. Also, it can cause congenital heart disease, fetal or facial dysmorphism affecting the, face, the development of the face. And these symptoms can be similar to those found in what we call the fetal alcohol syndrome. If a woman is addicted to alcohol drinking and she got pregnant and she's drinking a, a, lot of, a, a large amount of alcohol during pregnancy, this can cause similar manifestations. So what we can see in the phenylketonuria is a little bit similar to the fetal alcohol syndrome. Also, the children who are having the disease or inherited the disease from their parents, okay, they, if they are not treated from, you know, uh, uh, the, the early ages or the early years of their, you know, life, later on, they can be also complaining of the microcephaly, they can have epilepsy, skin eczema, they have a musty body odor caused by the buildup of phenyl acetic acid in the urine. They will have decreased skin and hair pigmentation. This is due to lack of tyrosine, okay? So they will have also severe intellectual disability, behavioral problems like hyperactivity, problems with the language, memory, and attention. So these are all signs and symptoms of the untreated phenyl ketonuria in children if, of course, uh, the condition is not treated very early in life. Of course, if we do MRI scanning for those having untreated phenyl ketonuria, they will have visible structural brain changes. And as we mentioned that due to the tyrosine deficiency, there will be deficiency in mel mel melanin production, melanin pigmentation, okay, this it will be affected due to the tyrosine deficiency. So those children having phenylketonuria, they have lacking tyrosine and melanin, they will have blue eyes and have fair hair and fair skin due to the lack of pigmentation. So a child born with phenylketonuria can be treated by early dietary intervention. But the problem is that if a damage is caused to the fetus in the intrauterine life, this most probably is irreversible. This is, that's the problem. So the, ch the child after 
painful, okay? He might suffer from some, you know, behavioral changes, some intellectual disability due to the buildup of, of phenylalanine. This can be treated by diet, okay? If the diet is given to the, to the child, which is restricted, doesn't contain phenylalanine, these changes which can occur later in life may be reversible. But the problem is with the changes happened already in the intrauterine life. That's the problem. If they happen already to the fetus, they are mostly irreversible. So that's why a woman, if she's planning to get pregnant while she's having the disease, there are some precautions to be fulfilled and to be done before she got pregnant. So the treatment of this disorder is a phenylalanine restricted diet. This will require restricting the intake of protein rich foods, especially those of animal origin. And this dietary restriction can be maintained until the age of 17 years old, after you know uh, the full uh, uh, brain development and after the, the, the child go to the adult food uh, period, okay? Then we can you know stop the restricted diet after that. But also some studies say that in people who have you know, uh, stopped the restricted diet after the age of 17, they suffered some problems regarding the IQ, the behavioral changes and so on. But these were, you know, reversible. As I told you, those changes occurring late can be reversible. So once they resume the normal restricted diet, which is uh, uh, free of phenylalanine, these changes improve again and the problem disappear. So the restriction of diet in general, we can say it can be stopped at the age of 17, but if the child or if the person who is having the disease suffered some IQ problems or behavioral changes after the age of 17, after taking a phenylalanine diet, then he can go or resume pack the restricted diet again. Am I clear so far, everyone? Clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, very good. So now let's talk about what we should do for a woman who wants to get pregnant while she's having the metabolic disease. She's having phenyl ketonuria and she has high levels of phenyl alanine and she wants to get pregnant. First of all, this should be started from the preconception period, of course, when we deal with a medical disorder, when, a, when we deal with a, with a chronic medical disorder, whatever the disease, cardiac, diabetes, hypertension, any disease, and a woman wants to get pregnant while she's having this chronic disease, we, we should start preparing her from the preconception period because unplanned pregnancies will be very harmful to her. So from the preconception period, we must sure that the woman is taking reliable contraception before, you know, uh, uh, before her intentions to get pregnant to make sure that the phenylalanine levels are normal before she got pregnant. So we need her to take proper contraception until she makes sure that her phenylalanine levels are normal. Because if we assume that a woman who is like, 23 year old or 24 year, years old and she wants to get pregnant, okay? And of course, these women, as we mentioned that most of them will stop the restricted diet after the age of 17, okay? So she will have like five, six or seven years. She's taking, you know, a free diet. She's not restricting her phenylalanine intake. So of course she will have high levels of phenylalanine. If she got pregnant like that, this might affect her baby. So first, we need to resume her on a phenylalanine restricted diet. And until then, she will take a contraception until we make sure that the phenylalanine levels become, become normal again, and then she can get pregnant. What type of contraception can be used in such condition? There is no relationship between the type of the contraception and phenylketonuria. 
Okay, I mean that a woman can take any form of contraception, but it's preferred to give her a type of contraception that gives her a regular cycle. Okay, because if she takes, for example, a progesterone only contraception, okay, if she takes like, uh, or, or if she's inserting Mirena, like the levonorgestrel intratrine system, her cycles will, will be irregular, okay, or she might even have amenorrhea. So at this time, it will be difficult to diagnose an unplanned pregnancy, okay? But if you give her a combined oral contraception, this will give her a regular cycles, so you can monitor the cycles every month, and if there is a missed period, then you can suspect a pregnancy. That's the idea, okay? So it's preferred to give her combined oral contraception, and then once she decides to you know get pregnant then we can shift also to a barrier contraception without any hormones to make sure that her cycles now are very natural okay so of course because any kind of hormone can affect the cycle even the combined bills so it's better to give combined bills then once now she has intentions to get pregnant then we can shift on barrier contraception to make sure that her cycles are very natural and if there is any missed period, we can diagnose any unplanned pregnancy. So this is the first thing, the contraception. Then we have to counsel the woman that she should go to the phenylalanine restricted diet because this will make sure that her phenylalanine levels are normal and this will make sure that her baby is not affected by the toxic levels of phenylalanine. So we should aim to make sure that the phenylalanine concentrations are normalized before pregnancy or before conception or less optimally, okay, before 10 weeks of gestation. So better or the ideal to make sure that the phenylalanine levels are completely normal before pregnancy. Less ideal that these levels become normal before 10 weeks of gestation at least. Okay, but of course, it's better to make sure that they are normal before pregnancy from the start, I mean. So these women wanting to get pregnant, they will be put on a phenylketonuria program, which makes sure that they will have a reduced natural protein intake or they will have a protein exchange, like they will get, you know, protein supplements, which are free from phenylalanine or having lower phenylalanine levels because we know that the natural proteins coming from the animal source from the meat from the nuts and so on they contain phenylalanine so of course the woman will not be able to you know uh, uh, separate the phenylalanine from the natural diet but of course she will take a protein uh, supplements which are having low phenylalanine levels and the target according to the national screening program of phenylketonuria will be from 120 to 300 micromoles, or according to the European guidelines, it can be from 120 to 360 micromoles. This is the target phenylalanine levels before pregnancy. That's my target before pregnancy. Of course, as a preconception uh, uh, routine we do for all women, and also for those having any medical disorder, she should start a folic acid supplementation to reduce the risk of neural tube defect. And we are going to monitor the phenylalanine levels twice weekly until we have three to four blood tests or readings below 350. Once we have three or four readings below 350, this is now considered safe for the woman to get pregnant and we can uh, guide her to stop the contraception and she can have she can have unprotected sexual intercourse to try to conceive and if she took you know more than one year to get pregnant and she fails to do that then you have of course to refer her to a fertility specialist because you know it's hard to for the woman to you know become uh, 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 you know compliant with this restricted diet and she will keep taking protein supplementation you know and so on this is you know uh, uh, tough for a woman to be compliant uh, too so if she failed to get pregnant within one year 
then refer her to a fertility specialist, you know, to make uh, uh, any strategies to fasten the uh, uh, time to conceive because keeping her on that, on that restricted diet is very difficult to her. So this is as a preconception care. The woman should take contraception. She uh, uh, will have folic acid. Once the phenylalanine levels become more, uh, less than 350 micromoles for three or four readings, then she can have unprotected sexual intercourse. In the antenatal care, we need a multidisciplinary team as any medical disorder. We need a dietitian, obstetrician with, with a special interest in the disease, a metabolic consultant, and a midwife. Also, the partners or the family members of the woman should have, you know, an information or an idea about the condition to, to support her for the restricted diet and for, you know, uh, 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 to be compliant, I mean, to the diet and to the protein supplementation and so on, and to help her during her pregnancy. And of course, the woman will need a, conti a continuous nutritional guidance during her pregnancy. Because that's, that's the cornerstone of the problem, you know, when we restrict the phenylalanine, we will make sure that these toxic levels will not pass to the baby and the baby will, you know, grow safely without any problems. During the pregnancy, we need to measure the phenylalanine level three times per week during the antenatal care. And also make sure that the patient is having an adequate and balanced diet, especially in the first trimester, uh, when she might, you know, complain of nausea and vomiting or even hyperemesis gravidarum. So, of course, this will affect her dietary intake. So, make sure that uh, uh, you are adjusting the diet according to her general condition. If the patient is, you know, uh, having a problem with uh, uh, food intake and her diet, especially in the first trimester because of uh, nausea and vomiting or hyperemesis, then we might consider her admission to the hospital to make sure that we control the level of phenylalanine, especially at the first trimester. Because we know that the first trimester is the critical period. That's the time of organogenesis. You know, uh, most of the organs can be affected during that time. So if we pass safely from the first trimester, then most probably the baby will pass safely uh, during the rest of pregnancy. We need to measure the amino acid levels, minerals, and trace elements, and we make we we have to make a full blood count before the dating scan, the early dating scan, and also at 20 to 22 weeks of gestation. I'm talking about other minerals or other vitamins should be also measured at the dating scan, at the poking, and also at 20 to 22 weeks of gestation. And as we know that. Those patients having phenylketonuria is most probably having tyrosine deficiency. Then we need to give tyrosine supplementation after 16 weeks of gestation. Another important point we should consider when we deal with a patient during pregnancy is when we give supplementations, we need to know what are the other, you know, vitamins and minerals found in that supplement. So in pregnancy in general, you don't prescribe a multivitamin without knowing its contents because it might contain other vitamins in excessive amounts which may, might be harmful in pregnancy, like vitamin A, for example. Then we need to look first to the constituents of any multivitamins before we give it or prescribe it to a pregnant lady. Regarding the ultrasound surveillance in pregnancy, of course, we do the, the routine first ultrasound scan, which look at the nuchal translucency, and we look at the uh, signs of neural tube defects like anencephaly or spina bifida or so on. And then we have the second trimester ultrasound scan, which is done between 18 to 20 weeks gestation. And here we can detect any congenital abnormalities in the different organs like congenital heart disease, microcephaly. And also this will aid in the counseling for the woman, if there will be, you know, any congenital malformation, some women might choose to terminate uh, the pregnancy before, you know, uh, the baby grows more in her pregnancy. So that's, of course, a practice in some countries. Other countries prohibit that. 
determination of pregnancy. So according to the laws in your country. So uh, uh, the second trimester ultrasound scan will give you an idea about the uh, uh, different organs. We need also to do a fetal medicine scan with a fetal echo at 20 to 20, uh, 22 weeks of gestation. So we need a fetal echo at or between 20 to 22 weeks of gestation to make sure that the heart is normal because the risk of congenital heart defects in cases like that are about seven to 10%. Of course, identification of any anomalies provides the early option of termination, as I told you, according, of course, to the law or the apportion law in the country. But of course, in the UK, there are different apportion laws. This is not important for part one in Marsoji now. You will be, of course, studying that for part two in Marsoji. There are some apportion laws you need to know about a determination of pregnancy in the United Kingdom. And as we have the risk of intrauterine growth restriction, we need to do a serial growth scans at least every four weeks to uh, detect the uh, intrauterine growth restriction and microcephaly. When the baby is having head circumference below the uh, uh, two standard deviation of the mean of the gestational age, this is uh, uh, suspicious of microcephaly. And when the uh, uh, head circumference is less than five uh, or more standard deviation from the mean, okay, this is a di diagnostic of microcephaly. But generally speaking, if the head circumference is below three standard deviation from the mean uh, uh, of gestational age, Okay, this means that the prognosis will be borderline or guarded, it means that the prognosis may be not very good. Okay, so we measure the head circumference and according to, uh, uh, you know, the relation of the head circumference from the mean at that specific gestational age, okay, we have charts like this head circumference is normal for that gestational age, this head circumference is low, for that gestational age and so on. These are charts found for those who are, you know, uh, interested in the ultrasound or, or in the fetal medicine ultrasound. Then if we have a head circumference below five standard deviation, this means that this is diagnostic for microcephaly. But in general, when we have a head circumference below three standard deviation, the prognosis will be borderline or not that good. Clear so far, everyone? Any question so far? Okay. So that's during the antenatal care. Okay, so what about delivery and intrapartum care? Is there any timing or any obstetric indication or, or any story indications for cesarean section for those women and so on? No, phenylketonuria, it will be dealt with as any uh, uh, pregnancy regarding the timing and the mode of delivery. It will be according to obstetric indications. I mean that if the pregnancy is doing well, so the, the patient can deliver vaginally and at term, but if there is intrauterine growth restriction, then I'm going to deal with the, the, with the pregnancy as a case of intrauterine growth restriction and so on. So here, the timing and the mode of delivery will be according to the obstetric indications, and it will not be influenced by the disease. Also, the woman who is having phenylketonuria can breastfeed her baby. Breastfeeding is safe. This is very important information to know, as the breast milk contains lower phenylalanine concentrations than even most infant formulas found in the market. Therefore, children can ingest larger quantities of the breast milk without exceeding the recommended phenyl alanine limit. And postnatally, after delivery, the metabolic consultant should review the mother after three months postpartum and a, a, a pediatrician or a, a neonatologist should perform a neonatal examination to assess any clinical features of phenylketonuria in the newborn baby. And according to the routine phenylketonuria screening program found in most of the countries, neonates will be examined or screened for phenylketonuria uh, on day five. A blood spot will 
be taken from the baby and it will be examined for the phenylalanine levels. And if the uh, uh, child has inherited the disease from the parent, okay, so it's recommended that a clinical psychologist will assess the child at 18 months, 4, 8, and 14 years to identify any developmental or cognitive problems and suggest ad any additional educational support if required. So this is what we should do after delivery of the uh, baby. Also, the psychological support is very vital in the management of any woman with phenylketonuria. Because, you know, to maintain that phenylalanine-restricted diet is somehow, you know, uh, challenging for the woman. So she will need a support, em uh, emotional support, psychological support from her partner, from, from her family. This is very important. And also the general practitioner, the GB, is having a, cr a, a crucial role in, you know, making that essential link between the patient and the multidisciplinary team. He would refer her to the dietitian or to the metabolic consultant, to the obstetrician when needed. So the GB should be aware of the condition of the patient and should make this important link between the patient and her multidisciplinary team. So this is what we need to know about phenylketonuria and how to be managed during pregnancy. One of the topics, I mean, it's uh, important for the biochemistry, it's given in biochemistry and also have some clinical, you know, uh, uh, implications. So we should know this information for the exam. So to summarize what we have discussed, so the buildup of phenylalanine is toxic to the brain and can affect the myelin uh, synthesis. And the normal phenylalanine should be below 120 micromoles. The common clinical manifestations are IUGR, microcephaly, congenital heart disease, and facial dysmorphism. Also, <clears throat> due to the tyrosine deficiency, the children having phenylketonuria will have blue eyes, fair hair, and fair skin due to melanin deficiency. The treatment is phenylalanine-restricted diet, which can be stopped at the age of 17 years old. Any woman before getting pregnant she should be counseled about the phenylalanine restricted diet. She should take a contraception until making sure that the phenylalanine levels are normal before pregnancy. Once a woman is having three to four phenylalanine readings below 350 micromoles, now she, this is considered safe for her to get pregnant. And these values are very important, by the way, to remember, okay? She will be managed by a multidisciplinary team, including a dietitian, obstetrician, metabolic consultant, and a midwife. And in pregnancy, we are going to measure the phenylalanine levels three times per week. We are going to make a profile for the amino acids, other vitamins, uh, trace elements, and CBC at the dating scan, and also at 20 to 22 weeks of gestation. And we can give tyrosine supplementation after 16 weeks of gestation. We will make a fetal echo between 20 and 22 weeks of gestation. This is very important also. We can encourage the woman to breastfeed her baby. There will be no problems of breastfeeding and the woman should be reviewed after delivery, three months after delivery, and the neonate will be screened for phenylketonuria by the fifth day after delivery. And of course, there will be further assessments if the baby inherited the disease by a clinical psychologist as mentioned. By this, we come to the end of our topic, phenyl uh, ketonuria in pregnancy. I hope you enjoyed this. Now, of course, if you have any comment, any feedback, any question related to the topic, other topics to the MRCG part one in general, to the course, of course, I would be happy to listen to your questions and answer. Hello, sir. Yes, sir. I have a question. Uh, what is sure. the diet? Phenylalanine free diet. What should you know it's it's mainly to avoid the animal proteins you know and the the patient can take you know carbohydrates can take you know uh, fruits vegetables and so on and once we come to the protein intake she can take 
plant proteins or she will take you know like protein supplementations there are you know artificial uh, uh, artificial protein supplementations found in the market like those who are you know in the uh, gym you know and the weightlifters they know that they take protein supplementations to increase their muscle gain you know it's something like that okay uh, like protein powders and so on but these proteins protein powders are formed without you know or uh, uh, made without phenylalanine amino acid so these are the protein supplementation Okay. Any other question? Do you have any question in general for part one MRCG for our course? Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, most of us join late because of time difference. Um, please, can you make this presentation available to us? Yes, yes. The the presentation is recorded, and she will and, and this presentation will be available on our YouTube channel. Okay. Any other query? Sir, I want to ask you for uh, one question. Uh, not regarding yes. this, the ketone urea, I'm just ask asking about you. From which country you are talking? Yes, yes. I'm from Egypt. I'm Egyptian. Okay. Okay. Sir, I am Dr. Zishan Fatma from Lahore, Pakistan. Welcome. Okay, I'm, I'm from Egypt. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Very nice You're presentation welcome. you have done so far. My pleasure. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, thank you so much, everyone, for joining the webinar. I hope you enjoyed it. The webinar will be available on our YouTube channel. Also, you can check that channel for other free webinars. And also on uh, 16th uh, of this month, we have another webinar by Dr. Desiree. She will be talking about how to prepare for the exam. And also, she will be talking about the pedigree analysis and the modes of inheritance in genetics. So uh, you can follow up our page and uh, our groups for more information. Also, this Thursday, we are going to start this, the second phase of our course, the live session phase. So if you are interested, you can ask the team or contact the team as uh, uh, shared in the chat box, the contact number by WhatsApp. Again, I'm so uh, happy that you joined me today in this webinar and see you soon in other sessions and other webinars. See you, bye-bye.